Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Reagan Knope. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. Three hundred twenty-five words, no more and no less. And essentially, you have to know exactly what it is, the totality of your campaign, a couple months before each election. This is why that early deadline matters, is you're trying to project what voters are going to care about when they're casting their ballot a couple months ahead of time. I do think directly delivering the message of why your opponent isn't right, I think works. I think that does generally work. This is an episode dedicated exclusively to the voters pamphlet. All right, folks, uh, this week we have a very special and somewhat unusual episode. Uh, this is actually by listener request. Uh, Labor Commissioner Val Hoyle recommended this as a podcast topic. And so Reggie and I were happy to oblige because we both found it hilarious ourselves. Uh, and this we know week, that Reg- if it bombs, we can blame Val. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Uh, Reagan and I have spent the last hour or so perusing the voters pamphlet. And this is an episode dedicated exclusively to the voters pamphlet. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the the background logistics, some common strategies. But then what I think is most exciting is we I think we've got like five or seven what we describe as the funniest excerpts. Uh, they might be ridiculous. Um, they might be funny. They might be um, nonsensical, but things that uh, we find entertaining that we're going to highlight for you. And then we'll talk briefly about what the themes that we see in these um, statements are and what it tells us about the state of the election going into the 2022 general election. Um, so that's an overview of the show. Uh, before we jump into some of the specifics, um, Reagan, I think a lot of people who aren't candidates don't understand how awful <laughs> making a voters pamphlet statement is. And by awful, I just mean time consuming, logistically heavy, Um, expensive, et cetera. So can you talk a little bit about what it actually takes to submit a voter's pamphlet statement? Yes, Ben. So um, I've done quite a few of these, and I think um, I would describe them very much like um, if you're taking like a college course or high school class and you have your midterm. This very much feels like the midterm of your campaign because it's due pretty early compared to all the rest of the stuff that's going to happen on your campaign. Um, you know, your a lot of your flyers, a lot of your paid media, and a lot of your activity um, is going to happen in the fall. But this thing gets submitted um, pretty early on. So I'm looking at the Secretary of State, the last day to file um, these, I believe, was August 30th. Um, and Ben, you did yours. You can, you can check me if I'm wrong. But August 30th. Yeah, yeah that's right. And in the May primary, they're due um, two days after the filing deadline in March. And so you really have to have uh, a lot of organization. You have to know what you want to say. And so I think that the main thing here is, is that you have to have your campaign. Essentially, you have to know exactly what it is, the totality of your campaign, a couple months before each election. So Reagan, really interesting note on that. Um, if you look at May of 2020, so the primary in 2020 voters pamphlet statement, I think there's like one or two candidates. I think Maxine Dexter was one who mentioned COVID-19 in their voters pamphlet statement. Nobody else mentioned it. And it was the number one issue um, that voters were thinking about by the time ballots were cast. This is why that early deadline matters is you're trying to project what voters are gonna care about when they're casting their ballot a couple months ahead of time. Right. And uh, that's a super good point. And the other thing too is uh, that you have those really strict limits that we were talking about. So your word count is 325 words, no more, um, no less. And um, I don't believe that that includes the information furnished by, you know, friends of Jim Smith. Uh, I think that's not counted, although a lot of people get that confused. Um, And then you also have to submit a photograph that um, typically you want it to be 1.5 inches by 1.75 inches. Um, and there's a lot of requirements. You can't display um, the candidate's hands. It has to be a, a <laughs> shoulder, neck, and head shot. 
Um, you can't wear a flag pin or any other identifying <laughs> markers. If you have a background that isn't um, a single color, they can reject your photograph for that. So there's a lot of requirements. And uh, and the reason for a lot of these limits, by the way, um, is not nefarious. It's just um, a fairness thing. Nobody um, gets any additional benefit. And so it's really, it's a picture. Um, the the Secretary of State put, puts in all your information already from which candidate you are, which parties you appear on in the ballot and all that stuff. And then you're responsible for furnishing all that information below. Um, you can get in trouble for lying. I don't recommend lying in your voters pamphlet statement. You usually get, um, usually get busted on that. Back in 2018, there was a House District 54 race um, with a with a Republican, Sherry Held, and then um, a Democrat, and then another candidate had filed a Working Families Party candidate to challenge the Democrat because he had some, some issues in his background. And then she got caught laying on her voter's pamphlet statement, and it became a bigger <laughs> scandal. Um, and so it really, it can cause a lot of problems. So, um, and then you have to submit these uh, for state candidates, you submit it in a very um, old uh, WYSIWYG editor, and WYSIWYG stands for what you see is what you get, so you're kind of formatting it in there. A lot of people start it in Word, but you got to format it ultimately, um, and it's an online editor. Um, they won't fix your grammar, so if you screw stuff up, you can fix it before the deadline, but once you hit the deadline, um, you're done, right? And so um, the other thing is some people try to file it with signatures, and so here's the kind of um, the fee structure for these, by the way. So if you're a U.S. senator or a representative, it costs $2,500 or $3,000 to file your voter's pamphlet, or you need 500 signatures. And remember, this is 500 verified signatures. So if you submit 500 and one of them isn't a registered voter um, or something like that, your pamphlet statement will not, um, it won't count. And so you'd need to collect over very much just like doing a ballot measure. Um, okay, and then so for governor and labor commissioner, Three grand, um, state wow. senate, state representative, seven fifty. If you're a Supreme Court judge or Court of Appeals judge, three grand. Uh, and if you're a circuit court judge or your district attorney or your county judge, six hundred bucks. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll say before I kind of turn it over to you in terms of um, thoughts that you have about types of content. The big thing with this and why it matters so much is it gets mailed to every single voter in the state. You cannot mail as governor's candidate every single voter in the state for, you know, three grand, right? So it's a great deal um, for the candidates, I think. And it's really good for voters too. Um, I I have heard anecdotally from lots of voters who say it, it makes a huge difference for them. Um, yeah. That's why missing the voters pamphlet is a big deal if you're a candidate because um, you'll lose a lot of votes from that. So yeah, I was that I was just gonna make that point too. Um, one, I will say voters pamphlet is probably the most important moment of a campaign for most campaigns, yep. but I will say the further down ballot you are, the more important it is. Mm -hmm. Like Ron Wyden doesn't submit his voters pamphlet statement, he's still gonna get elected United States Senator. But if you're running for city council and you don't submit your voters pamphlet statement, it would be shocking to me if you did win, um, unless there was other circumstances that warranted it. Um, the second thing is, as Reagan was mentioning, you're basically on this little box on the Secretary of State, the back end of Orstar, putting all this stuff in. And there, I know of at least one horror story where they press submit right, you know, a couple minutes before the deadline and the page is still loading and it doesn't go through and their voters pamphlet statement does not show up. This was a state Senate race back in 2018, I think, or 2020. Um, so like it is a really high stress moment. Campaigns mm -hmm. and candidates spend a ton of time working on these. We're going to make light of a few things, but also want to recognize that like like for me, it was a very stressful, like I, you know, even in my race for, you know, all the things aside, like it was a very stressful thing I spent several weeks working on. Um, and I'm sure there's things that I didn't want to look at it because I'm sure there are things that I would have changed if I could go back now, but that is neither here nor there. Um, for the next section of the pod, we want to talk about some, some highlights of voter pamphlet statements that we think are indicative of common strategies before we get to the, the uh, blooper reel section um something that has emerged over the last i don't know how long this has been if you go back and look at voters pamphlet statements from like the tom mccall era you did not see long lists of endorsements at the bottom of every voters pamphlet statement today you do <laughs> virtually every major 
uh, like state legislative candidate, for example, is going to include a relatively long list of endorsements. Not all. Um, some people have different strategies. In fact, we'll call out a couple of these. Um, but that's basically pervasive. And the reason why that matters is, as Reagan alluded to in the logistics side, every endorsement that you include, any name of an endorser you include in the voters pamphlet statement, you need a signed form from that person, signed and dated, and you have to upload all of them to uh, the Secretary of State's website, and they have to be validated by the Secretary of State's website. If they reject it, or if you don't include um, a form, they will just erase the name from your voters pamphlet statement. So um, just keep that in mind when you're looking at things. Um, a couple common themes, quotes from validators. So taking endorsements to the next level is, is a written uh, endorsement, like a sentence or two validating a candidate. So for example, yep. Val Hoyle, previously mentioned, her the first thing in her voters pamphlet statement is a quote from Peter DeFazio, the, the person she's seeking to replace, highly respected in the district. That's where she wants to start. It's her strength. Same with Jamie McLeod Skinner in her, in her district. She starts with a quote from Ron Wyden. Um, interestingly, on Jamie McLeod Skinner's, this surprised both Reagan and I a little bit, but Reagan, you liked how she ended it. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't include specific endorsements. She ends by saying, nominated by the Democratic, Independent, and Working Families Parties, supported by Democrats, Republicans, unions, and organizations throughout our communities. Reagan, why did you think that was an interesting approach? Um, I just liked it because it was different. You were talking about how oh, this has become a common strategy to list endorsements. And so it always is kind of interesting to me, and I don't know if voters will notice this, but as a political nerd and as someone who's worked on campaigns, I notice when people do things differently. And um, a lot of people think it's like, oh, they did it different. It's bad. Like it could be good. It could it could get someone's attention. And really, that's what you're looking for. And all these, you know, it's printed on gray paper. And so in all this sameness of this black text and gray paper, you've got like something that stands out. That's important. That matters. Right. And so I think you want to look for candidates who have those kind of clever um, ideas. Um, doesn't mean it's going to necessarily change a lot about the outcome, but I look for I look for candidates who do things that are clever. Totally. Um, so another thing that we saw in quotes this time, this is um, we thought there was a partisan uh, uh, trend, but it actually wasn't. People quote themselves. Uh, Christine Drazen quotes herself in her voters pamphlet statement for governor. Um, I think Janine Solman did for Senate and maybe a couple others. Um, and then other candidates included taglines, basically like campaign catchphrases that summarize their campaign. So on one end of the spectrum, you have Tina Kotek, proven leader ready to tackle Oregon's serious challenges. And on the other end, um, I'm not sure how to say her name. I think it's uh, Don Donis Smith, she's the Constitution Party nominee. Hers is honor God, defend the family, restore the republic, which is very Constitution Party of her. Um, so yeah, we mentioned the, the limitations of formatting. Like you get these flyers in the mail and you've got different fonts and images and colors. And in the voter pamphlet statement, it's literally bold, italics, underline, or all caps. And so you have yep. different variations of that. Um, I am not a fan of the all caps in general. I think the all caps comes across as a little bit like screaming at you. Um, but there is quite a bit of usage that you see in that. Um, there's actually been there, uh, one thing I want to point out. I do not have the link in front of me, but there are studies that show that all caps text is harder to read than um, mm -hmm. traditional text just because all the letters look more the same. Um, like the different shapes and the different heights and the different like widths of the letters make them easier to read. And so when you go all caps, all your letters start to look the same size and height. And so it, it really reduces your readability. So while I think it can look good um, as like subheaders to break up regular headers and text, um, using them as headers in uh, like formatted like that with the all caps um, is I, I don't think it's a great strategy because of that readability issue. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, here's another one. We're not going to call a candidate out on this because several others did it, but there's one candidate in particular who is very bad. Um, in your endorsement section, what you have to remember is who, you have to know your audience. Your audience is like the largest swath of people you're ever going to communicate with, really. Um, so these are not political insiders, although there are some political insiders mixed in. So like there's one candidate who listed a bunch of acronyms and endorsements, and I guarantee at least half the people reading those did not know what at least one of those 
acronyms was. And one of the acronyms is an acronym that like three organizations have an acronym for. Um, so acronyms, bad practice, candidates don't do acronyms, um, although it does yeah. save your word count. So sometimes like if you see acronyms, it's because they were at 327 and they need to get down <laughs> to 325. Um, this is an old school thing. You see it a lot of local candidates. Um, in fact, we've had Jason Snyder, mayor of Taggart on this podcast. He gave out his phone number on the podcast. That's a pretty, not super common tactic, but like it's pretty old school local politics. Like if you're yep. running for mayor or city council, um, kudos to Bill Kenimer and Jeff Golden, um, two candidates for state Senate who included either a personal email or phone number. Um, on their flyer. I think that's a, it's a nice touch. It's a nice touch. And it certainly is going to attract unwanted emails of some kind, but take some guts. <laughs> it sure does. Uh, and then Reagan, uh, what I think of as a bold move and risky and honestly not something I would recommend um, for candidates is going negative in the voters mm -hmm. pamphlet. Can you talk about a couple of the instances of folks going negative this time? Yeah, so the one I remember from the past before we get into ones that are current um, was uh, New Bueller's statement in 2018 is very um, taking on Brown. It was very much um, his main tagline in that election. I probably won't ever forget it was uh, I will lead where Kate Brown has failed. Um, mm -hmm. And so he put like every instant that she failed and then how he would lead. And so it was very much like a contrast um, piece. So the examples that we noticed in here Mike Erickson, um, in the bottom half of his statement, after talking about himself a little bit and his background and his goals, um, he talks about where his opponent, Andrew Salinas, he thinks is wrong on issues. And so he gives three or four um, bullet points. He actually cites the Oregon legislative record, too, which I think is good. I'm um, trying to source his stuff a little bit there. Um, and then we also saw um, Ben Edel in Senate District 19 goes um, very negative against uh, the Democrat, Rob Wagner, an incumbent, tried to tying her to Kate Brown, which is generally a good strategy for Republicans. It's exactly what um, his pollsters would tell him to do. Um, but it's kind of, it would be kind of interesting to see. Um, I think that's a pretty tough race for him, so I doubt that it's going to work there, but it is something to note. Um, and then Alan Stout in District 7 goes negative against John Lively and is looking to tie him uh, as well to Kate Brown. And so I think um, in places where you're kind of seeing it emerge in races that are um, tough races for Republicans or a little bit harder, maybe Republicans are going to be the underdogs. So maybe you see them trying to think outside the box again. So um, kudos for thinking outside the box, although I don't know that that particular strategy is going to work. Um, but I tend you know, to, I mean, we still like I, to highlight it. Yeah, no, I think it's, it, it is interesting. My general take is like when you go negative, when you go negative, it might hurt your opponent, but it's going to hurt you too. Um, mm -hmm. Because, and especially in the voters pamphlet, because you cannot hide who this is coming from. Like you can't like at the end of an ad be like paid for by friends of Ben Bowman. You have to like own it because your name and your face are at the top of the page. So when you're going negative, you're pretty much owning the fact that you're not even trying to rise above negative politics, that you're doubling down on it. Um, but to your point, will, like, yeah, go ahead. I will say I do. I've always been more of a fan of um candidates delivering their own hits directly because i think it mm. does build credibility so like when i see a mailer from an outside group attacking a candidate on behalf of another candidate without mentioning the candidate i'm like I i'm sure that works but i think a lot of people think okay but like what's the reason that this is appearing right and so i always liked it better and i always encourage my candidates to if you're gonna say something negative about your opponent or something where you're contrasting say it yourself because I think it builds credibility from voters' minds saying, okay, this guy's willing to call his opponent out. Um, so in one sense, I think it may not work here just because of the, I think the format is the biggest limitation here. You don't have a lot of format to really draw out that opposition because you also have to be introducing yourself because if you forget to do that, it doesn't work. But I do think directly delivering the message of why your opponent is, isn't right, I think works. I think that does generally work. That's that's good good pushback, and I actually agree. I, I agree with what you just said. Like I, because I'm I'm not saying you should never go negative, or there's never like sometimes no, yeah. people do egregious things, or like their record needs to be highlighted, or whatever. Um, I think it is just the the not format the the venue of the attack just feels feels odd. But we'll see. We'll follow those races and see how they turn out. Um, okay, now to the, <laughs> my favorite sections of the podcast. Uh, funniest moments, the blooper reel, 
of uh the 2020 general elections voters pamphlet what all right so i want to i'm going to front load this because yes, yes. before we deliver um these embarrassing moments <laughs> i want to talk about my embarrassing moment so okay. um i actually i was working for um ben schmoller who's a friend of mine he's currently running for mayor of redmond when he ran in the house district 53 open primary in 2018 i did his voters pamphlet statement um, I thought it was very good, and I'll share it with Ben and see if he agrees. Um, but in that voters pamphlet statement, we use his name quite a bit, and his name has uh, two M's in the middle of it. And I, in the top reference to his name that we write, so the first or the second time that we write his name, it is missing one of the M's. And to this day, no <laughs> voter emailed us about it. No one talked to us about it, but Ben noticed and so I will never live that down. Um, so I get exactly how um, devastating it is sometimes to like see these things in print and go, oh my gosh, I screwed up in the voters pamphlet. Um, but that also gives me license now to make fun of you guys. So um, <laughs> I just wanted to give that out front. We feel very sorry for you guys. And this does not reflect at all on how we think about any of these candidates. It's just stuff that we found interesting that was yeah, some, of, some of these are not bad. Some of these are actually yes. like, like I'm jealous yes. of at least one of these. Um, but yeah, yeah let's, some, um, of that, some of them are pretty bad. I'm going to separate um, these into the mistakes and then, and then interesting stuff. So, okay. You um, should do, you should do the first one, Reagan, because we, I looked at this one and did not notice yes. it because I was just skimming, but you noticed what I would call probably the most egregious mistake of the 2022 voters. Pamphlet. Yes. What, what was it? So, and I'm I'm pulling this up to make sure I get it right, but if, for state representative in District 42, there's a Republican candidate named Scott Trahern. And Trahan. at the bottom Trahan. of, Trahan, I'm sorry, Trahan. And at the bottom of his voters pamphlet, it says in all caps, vote Scott Trahan for state representative. And you know, I think that works. I think you're making sure people know <laughs> what to do. Unfortunately, in state representative District 16, a another Republican candidate named Keith Lemke uh, running against uh, our good friend Dan Rayfield at the bottom of his voters pamphlet. It says vote Scott Trahan for state representative. <laughs> not ideal for Mr. Not, Keith to have good. all of his votes go to the 42nd district. <laughs> However, I will call out. I will say this might be a Republican response to gerrymandering. And uh, Keith is just trying to shift all of his votes to Scott in another district so that he can actually win. I think um, Rob, Rob knows could be in serious trouble in his mm -hmm. Southeast Portland district because all of Lemke's votes are now going to we'll, go to Scott. We'll watch this one on election night and we'll find out uh, <laughs> what happens there. So, okay. So for the next, uh, the next mistake, this is a slightly smaller mistake. This is a candidate for Lynn County commissioner. Um, it's kind of funny because of what it is the context of what it's talking about reagan what was the what was the mistake yep so um in the voters pamphlet there's a section where you can pro provide your education background and uh the republican candidate um current win lynn county commissioner will tucker um in his educational background it begins with spum college and that's not the name of an educational institution, unfortunately, it is a misspelling of some college, uh, noting that he had some some um, college level education. So um, a, an unfortunate uh, voters pamphlet statement, um, typographical error. So I'm going to do the next one because I found this funny. Um, Michael Sipe, friend of the pod uh had created reg and i were talking about this some people like they'll like there's these required fields occupational background educational background etc sometimes people will add other fields after that at the end of his voters pamphlet statement michael sipe created like a community service section like ways he served the community and he included being a title sponsor of the 2022 to shoots county fair as community service but he literally just purchased the title sponsorship with campaign funds to support his campaign. So I think that's a stretch in terms of community service, but I'm sure it was helping the fair. So uh, we'll give him a pass for that. I would encourage um, everyone to Google that also, because it's actually the, KTVZ did something super interesting with it, where they actually turned it into a coverage about how like how many political candidates were at the Deschutes County Fair and how it was bigger than ever in terms of like how many candidates were advertising and active there. So it really stirred an interesting conversation, actually. There you go. Um, in fact, Reagan, you should email me that, and I'll try to put a link to it in the uh, in the show notes so people can take a look. 
I'm fiercely um, Googling right now, Ben. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, educational background and, uh, <laughs> and occupational background. So, Reagan, you found a legislator with a unique uh, occupational background. Uh, what did you discover um, from Representative Boomer Wright's past that kind of came up in the voters' pamphlet statement? Well, I will admit, um, having a little bit of prior knowledge on this one, I uh, was part of a candidate interview for an organization I worked for um, who interviewed um, Mr. Boomer Wright when he was running um, for state representative in um, 2020, which I think was his first election. And um, now Representative Gerald um, actually, it's his first name. Gerald Boomer Wright oh. is the former general manager of Sea Lion Caves, which I think is actually one of the best <laughs> um, occupations that you could possibly put on the voters pamphlet. Um, if you guys notice some other interesting ones, uh, just definitely let us know. But that was one of my favorites. Uh, that is a good one. And honestly, probably because he's he, his district is coastal, right? It's South Coast. Yes. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's also, yeah, you're just right. The genre, it's the right genre for him. It appeals to the base. Um, okay. So uh, another, another um, occupational background or current occupation, I think this is listed for these two. These are both Democratic candidates, I believe, Jesse Smith and Ben Watts. Um, they're both running for state house in red, reddish districts, and they both listed stay at home dad uh, or stay at home parent as yep. uh as an occupation, which not saying bad at all. I actually think it's kind of cool. Reagan, as a former uh, former stay at home dad, um, did this appeal? Are you going to vote for these candidates now? Um, well, I don't have the opportunity to vote for either of them in my district, but I do give a lot of kudos to them. Stay at home dad is not something that you see in the voters pamphlet a lot. Um, I will put former stay at home dad uh, in my voters pamphlet statement <laughs> should I ever have the opportunity to to place one. We cannot wait. Um, okay, now moving to educational background. This one I found very funny, so I felt like needed to share with the with the world. Uh, Greg Smith, state representative. He is he unopposed? I think he's unopposed. I think Greg Smith is unopposed. I think you're right. G Greg Smith will be returning to the Oregon State Legislature, and in his educational background section, he lists being an Eagle Scout, which okay, there's, there's mm -hmm. something there maybe. Uh, but he also lists a 2013 honorary degree from Future Farmers of America, which I am going to say is stretching it a little bit when it comes to educational background. <laughs> but I do not just... know what is required to get that honorary degree, but I will That's investigate. Um, as someone who has spent, uh, who has just recently purchased a farm, I probably do need an honorary <laughs> farming degree. Um, so I'll be investigating that. And I will say, My... look, Ben, I have, I think... <laughs> Representative Smith has brought up a very good point. If you were able to earn merit badges in school, I think that would increase a grades and graduation rates. So we should look into that. Uh, I think ODE is in the process of evaluating what the graduation requirements should be. Reagan, I encourage you to write in and um, include merit badges. Uh, but the reason why I do put it there is because honorary traditionally means you did not complete a rigorous course of study to receive this it usually means they're like granting it to you more like a, an award um or recognition of of some sort of like you know service to the institution but anyway neither here nor there yep. um two quick endorsements i'll highlight um marty wildy state representative from the eugene area is running for circuit court judge is that right reagan yep He's running for circuit court judge in Lane County, I believe running against an incumbent. Um, that, that Those were two interesting voters pamphlet statements. Um, I think what I will say to cut to the chase is his opponent has a really good voters pamphlet statement, which isn't always the case for judge incumbents. They don't always necessarily have the political um, sense of how to make a good voters pamphlet statement. But I will say um, his opponent's is good. It's got good endorsements, good quotes. I think Representative Wildes is pretty strong too. Um, but he lists an endorsement from former state representative and former GOP House leader, uh, Mike McLean, and also former circuit court judge. Um, so I thought that was uh, interesting, worth highlighting. And uh, I think my favorite endorsement of the entire voters pamphlet came from a future legislator um, from my neighboring district, Hi Fam. He's the Democrat. It's a relatively safe Democratic seat. He's widely expected to win. He lists an endorsement from Diego Valeri, the Portland Timbers soccer star, 
uh, which is talk about Reagan things that like catch people's eyes. I think Diego Valeri is going to catch uh, people's eyes more so than, you know, insert mayor or state rep or school board member here in your voters pamphlet list. I think anything you can do to break out of that, like um, that that box that you tor- p- typically put politicians in or that most people mentally put politicians in is great. And this is one of those things where it's like, if you can do something splashy like that, um, go for it. Pedal to the metal. Because I think, yeah, you're right. That will kind of break him out of the that box. People go, huh, that's interesting. You know, mm-hmm. so I think that works. We should uh, we should invite uh, Dr. Pham on and find out how he got the Diego Valeri endorsement. I was actually um, thinking that we should invite Diego Valeria on the podcast and, and ask why he endorsed Thai fam, but a, that works good, too. Either way, yours we'll probably more likely, Ben. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if we can land uh, Diego Valeri. Um, okay, so real quickly, we're about at uh, the time we wanted to hit, um, but Reagan, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the themes that we saw from candidates of both parties and some of the folks running for NAV stuff. Um, I don't think we should take too long on this, but just to give folks an overview of what the themes we saw across candidates, do you want to kick us off with GOP stuff? Yeah, so I think um, just definitely nationally, you're seeing a focus on crime, and that's definitely filtered down to Oregon, too. There are some um, pretty rough crime stats that have been pulled out um, for Portland, and so I think that that generally is causing um, Republican candidates to focus on crime. It's one of our top polling issues, so... I think that's true. And then secondary to that is um, a kind of, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people like to point at Portland and say, ha, look, you guys suck. Um, and there's plenty of Republican candidates doing that, trying to convince voters to vote Republican to prevent their area from becoming like Portland, whether they're talking about increased homelessness or the kind of urban style um, build up instead of build out. Um, theories or um, just general kind of democratic politics or whatever it is, they're kind of pointing that and saying, hey, vote Republican if you don't want where we live to look like Portland. Uh, And then the third one is a very metro area specific one, but it has been pretty potent. Um, The no tolling thing. So we've got this I-205 expansion and this I-5 Rose Quarter project. Both of them have this tolling component that seems likely to to appear. I don't know that it's like guaranteed that the tolling is coming, but it definitely feels inevitable. And so um, Republicans are kind of trying to um, focus on the opposition that Oregonians generally have to tolling, but especially the Oregonians who drive those major freeways um, have to the cost of, of tolling and um, really trying to oppose it strongly, I think, as kind of like elect me as uh, as that backstop to try to bring an end to this tolling scheme. So. Um, those were kind of those th- three themes that we definitely noticed in the Republican um, voters pamphlet statements. Ben, what did you see in the Democrat um, voters pamphlet statements? What issues were they focused on? Unsurprisingly, Democratic candidates, um, many of them are highlighting abortion access and um, what you'll what you're seeing. Like you'll always see Planned Parenthood, uh, Pack of Oregon, and yep. endorsements from Democrats. But what you're seeing is that's first on the list. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's an article in this week's Liftoff that people will hopefully have read on Monday or Tuesday. Um, it's from a Canadian publication, I think, actually, where it talks about how before Roe v. Wade, like 1% of Oregonians listed abortion as a top tier issue. And after Roe v. Wade was overturned, it jumps up to like 16% listed it as a top tier issue. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're in a district where, if you're in a district where there's more Democrats than Republicans, it's probably a pretty important issue to animate your voters and show them where you stand. Um, The phrase cost of living is another um, common Mm -hmm. phrase that you see on voters pamphlet statements from Democrats. Um, They're talking about things like, you know, cost of healthcare, um, cost of you know prescription drugs, cost of childcare, um, cost of housing, um, that shows up a lot. Um, and then finally, like you know, interestingly, I think you know Reagan in in safe GOP seats, you see like the Second Amendment a lot. In mm-hmm. in safe Democratic seats, you see like gun violence prevention or climate change a lot. Um, those issues don't tend to show up in swing seats as prominently, but they do show up depending on the district um, uh, for the candidates who are expected to win. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, some some a couple of issues that uh, showed up, I would say more in the sort of across parties or in nonpartisan slash non-affiliated candidates. 
education yep. and homelessness. Um, yeah. Both sort of like inoffensive and also really important to a lot of voters. Um, any commentary on that, Reagan? Um, I would say, yeah, education and homelessness, I think are, I mean, one, I do want to acknowledge how sad it is that homelessness is like at the very top of the list of issues for all of Gronians. It's just, it's just a massive, uh, massive problem. Got to work on um, more solving of that. And I think both parties will probably be coming to the table in the next two to three legislative sessions with some big solutions, hopefully. But <laughs> overall, I'd say that's one of those issues that it kind of doesn't matter what your politics are. It affects you um, because it's just dealing with like everybody's everyday life. If you're, if you're, you're, you're interfacing with um, the homeless issue or whether it's a safety issue for your, you know, your businesses and kind of your more um, urban areas, you still have these like medium sized cities that are represented by Republicans. Um, and then a lot of the inner city areas or the bigger city areas are split into multiple Dem districts. And so it, it just keeps bumping to the top because of how prevalent it is. And then education just affecting the future generations. It's super important for um, education to, to be on top of everybody's list. And I don't know that Republicans always had education as a list. I think that's been more prominent as of late, um, not just with the critical race theory stuff, but just education becoming a real um, uh I don't want to say battlefield in general, but I can't come up. Yeah, with it's, a, word. it's 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 a it's a it's a culture war issue for sure. Republicans mm -hmm. frame it as a parents' rights issue, which is reminiscent of what we saw in Virginia. Yep. Um, in their governor's election, um, for Democrats, it's often about like you know teaching real and accurate history. Um, but politics aside, I do think um, I do think education like this week, last week was a big week in education news with test scores coming out and graduation rate um, or graduation requirements being revisited by the Department of Ed. It is a really actually important issue that policymakers should be thinking about, not from a partisan lens, but actually like how do we improve our public education system in Oregon to better serve our kids, um, which isn't always how it shows up in a voter's payable statement. Um, okay, with that, I have one Reagan. more. I actually have one more thought. Yes. Sorry. Um, in it. the cost of living discussion, you saw Republicans and Democrats doing cost of living somewhat. But I think that it was interesting to see what Republicans focused on versus Democrats. Democrats, like you said, were focusing on like the cost of child care. Um, I can't remember the other ones you prescription said prescription drugs minute. and health care. Yeah. yeah, Republicans Housing. were focusing on inflation. Um, the price mm. of gas typically, and then um, the expenses of running a business too, which I think is a super interesting cross section into like, you know, the priorities that both of those types of candidates typically have, or that you generally see. It's not true for everyone, of course, but that you generally see from Republicans versus Democrats. So it's super which, interesting to look is, at those approaches. Which is funny because both right, right? <laughs> like like yeah, both, true. both right. Accurate. They just don't, they just talk differently um, about, what people are experiencing um, or what different people are experiencing. Um, Reagan, it's 11.30 p.m. Uh, I think it's time for us to adjourn the podcast. What I will say, folks, is if there's something we left out, if you saw something funny, entertaining or noteworthy in the voters pamphlet statements um, that you reviewed, they're up on the Secretary of State's website. We'll link to them in the show notes. Uh, highly recommended that you tweet at Reagan Canope and really just let him know what he uh, screwed up on. That's the best way to do it. Is that right? Uh, true. If you want to go through, um, if you can find a list, I don't think it's online anymore, but if you can find a list of all the clients I've had and read the voters pamphlet statements and find <laughs> mistakes, email me about them because I definitely want to know if I made a mistake that I definitely can't fix now. Um, that's the most important thing to keep me accountable in the future. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. As always, we really, uh, we really do appreciate your support. Um, and we appreciate episode ideas. So if you've got a topic, a guest, uh, anything you think we should cover, um, reach out to us. You can find us both on Twitter uh, or via email. Otherwise, best thing you can do to help is subscribe. Uh, subscribe on wherever you listen to podcasts. Our YouTube is steadily going up, which makes our producer buddy Terry very happy. Um, continue to support and we'll see you back here next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our guest, the Oregon Voter Guide. Ha, 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 ha.